is yours, Ulysses. Thanks, thanks, Alex. So I, I was talking with Roger that uh, my internet's not so good. So keep my video closed and I'll try to share the screen. But if I break up, let me know. And okay. then uh, maybe someone shares for me. Okay, so I'm sharing. <clears throat> so can you see my screen all right? Yes. Good. So let's start. So first of all, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to speak in this meeting. I, I'm sorry that I couldn't follow so many talks as I wanted, and also that I may have to go uh, out earlier during uh, uh, Diego's talk because I have a SW Joe uh, call uh, starting at midday. But uh, <clears throat> let's go on. So I'm going to uh, talk to you today about the Southern Whitefield Gamma Ray Observatory. <clears throat> so as you know, throughout the spectrum, the, the electromagnetic spectrum astronomy is uh, going through a revolution with many new proposed instruments or oper already operational instruments. And of course, the situation in the gamma ray band is not different. And uh, the, the biggest example that uh, of this renaissance that is happening at the very high energies is CTA that is coming up in the next uh, few years. But uh, gamma ray astronomy can be done from the ground uh, in two different ways. So one way is what you see here. So it's the observation of the Cherenkov light from, from with uh, <clears throat> uh, reflectors, with telescopes. And uh, here you're observing the Cherenkov light directly from the development of the shower in the atmosphere. And this is what CTA is going to do. But perhaps less well known is, is another technique which is very similar to what uh, people usually do in, in the cosmic ray field which is the collection of a sample of the shower front. So you directly detect the particles with some kind of detector, either scintillators or water tanks. And uh, you use this sampling of the shower front to reconstruct the shower and derive the properties of the, the incoming gamma ray. So th these ground-based techniques, they usually become active from a few tens of uh, GVs, which is when the fluxes become too small for the satellites to perform the observations. And these two ground-based techniques, they are really complementary in the sense that uh, the Cherenkov atmospheric uh, technique, which is the one that CTA is going to operate on, and you're going to hear more about that from, from Diego, is a very high precision technique. And it's easy to understand why this is so. Uh, this technique really can follow the Cherenkov light emitted throughout the development of the shower. So the reconstruction of the, sh reconstruction of the shower is very precise, and therefore we have very good angular and energy resolutions from, from these observations. And uh, the more it, we have a very large collection area already for one telescope, but we can use many, many telescopes together to make multiple images of the shower and reconstruct even better uh, the properties of the gamma ray. Um, and in fact, this technique, it excels from tens of GV up to 100 TV. And uh, it has nevertheless a couple of drawbacks. And it's the, the most important one perhaps is the fact that the duty cycle of the observations is very small. You need to be uh, during dark nights to make the observations. And this <coughs> means that we only have uh, 1,400 hours a year of observations. And uh, the field of view is not very large, but it's, it's, it's quite good. It's, uh, it's, it's rather extended. Four degrees and CTA is going to arrive to eight to 10 degrees with uh, new technologies. This other technique here, the, the shower sampling technique, let's say, it is complementary in the energy point of view. So it observes from the TV to the PV range, so ultra high energies. And although it has a modest precision because we are really relying on the sampling of uh, a few percent uh, of the, the particles of the shower front, while in the best cases, something uh, uh, around 50% today, um, it has a steroidian field of view. So you can see the whole uh, big part of the sky above you, and it operates day and night. So you have a 100% duty cycle. So it's a very good surveying and monitoring instrument in gamma rays. I mean, it's the, the only technique that can do that effectively. And because of this long exposure and excellent background determination, we can uh, achieve very high gamma hadron separation and flux sensitivity, especially in the very high energies towards the, the hundreds of TV and the PVs. So this is the scene of the gamma ray observatories worldwide. So you have uh, already operational instruments, you have Veritas, you have MAGIC, and you have HES, all this operates in the atmospheric uh, technique. And then you have Hawk and more recently LASSO, which are particle sampling instruments. And uh, of course, you have planet the CTA North and CTA South that is going to supersede the current uh, atmospheric telescopes. 
And you can see that there is no observatory for sampling, uh, for sour sampling or, or, or um, a large field of view observatory for gamma rays in, in the southern hemisphere. And that's where as SWGO comes in. Well, if you, if you were to resume uh, the achievements of the current generation of gamma ray telescopes, uh, in one sentence, uh, it would be the discover that the, the universe, uh, or the galaxy is full of TV accelerators. We didn't believe that. Uh, we, didn't, we couldn't know that there would be so many different sources and such abundance that were producing uh, TV signals in the sky, but it's full of them. And our hope with SWJO and LASSO is already showing the first signs of that is that uh, we are going probably to, to say that the universe is full of PV accelerators in a few years from now. So this is a sky map from Hawk. Here you can see a, a small picture of Hawk, so a very dense water tank of detector at uh, 4,000 uh, meters above sea level in Mexico. And you can see here uh, the, the area in the northern hemisphere that uh, Hawk can observe. And basically you can see the very prom the big prominence of the galaxy, the galactic plane, or the part of the galactic plane that is seen from the northern hemisphere, uh, full of sources and, uh, and extended emission. Um, and you can see here how the visibility of Hawk compares, for example, with Hess, and that there is a small overlap in which uh, joint studies have been made and, and have shown how promising it is to, to join together. I mean, the, the tens of TVs or uh, energy range or hundreds of GVs energy range, sorry, uh, up to the, the tens of TVs uh, from, from Hawk. Um, another experiment that just, just came up uh, this year and already produced uh, very exciting results. So these are results with only half of the observatory ready after one year of integration. You can see here the galactic plane or, or this portion of the galactic plane as seen with LASSO and uh, already 12 gamma ray uh, sources have been detected uh, with seven sigma significance above 100 TV from them. So, so this is very impressive. And Hawk has even detected the first uh, um, PV uh, gamma rays. And uh, this is most remarkable here from the Crab Nebula, where the, the, the spectrum has been extended up to 1.4 uh, PVs. And uh, so this means that uh, it has confirmed the Crab Nebula as, as a very efficient pevatron accelerator of electrons. So it's the first confirmed pevatron accelerator that we have but accelerator of electrons. And uh, we, are, we are still looking for a conclusive uh, uh, signature of uh, PVs of uh, hadrons. Anyway, as I said, I mean, the Northern Hemisphere observatories, they can see part of the galaxy, but it's only a small part and they miss all the rest of the galaxy, but crucially the galactic center, where there is a lot of science that we want to do and also uh, things like the Fermi bubbles. So it's really um, important and it's really the time that we, we plan an experiment in the South to complement what these, these, these great experiments have been doing in the Northern Hemisphere. And if, if you see, for example, here, the proposed sensitivity of SWGO for a one year and five year integration compared with the spectrum detected of the, the PV accelerators uh, seen by, by LASSO, you can see that there is a lot of potential to see uh, a lot of these PV accelerators in the southern hemisphere, where we can see much more of the galaxy and the galactic center. So um, really to uh, an experiment like that in the south would allow us to make a, a, a census of the cosmic ray population in the galaxy, which is unprecedented. So it's very timely that uh, we start thinking about this. And of course, there is other fields where we can, we can, we can do uh, an important science complement to what current experiments do. So it's very clear from this plot here. So this is the sensitivity of CTA after 50 hours integration uh, compared with uh, uh, the, the flux uh, expected from WIMP models of dark matter. So you can see that CTA really dominates the low energy regime. But as we go towards the high energy, it loses a lot of sensitivity. So uh, it, when you go above the tens of TV, an experiment like SWGO would be ideal to probe uh, the, the higher mass models of, uh, of dark matter and, and the decay of WIMPs. So um, <coughs> this is valid for basically all science cases. And it shows us that um, the, the higher energy end of the spectrum is really open still in the South. And an experiment like SWGO is, is, is uh, very timely to, to fill this niche. There is another area in which uh, a wide field experiment like SWGO can um, give good contributions. And this is the observation of transients and variable sources. And this is because we are wide field experiment 
and can uh, monitor 24 seven this kind. So this means that we have a, a chance of observing GRBs uh, when they explode. And here is, a, is an example showing the, the data points from a magic observation of GRB 190114C, which was the first one that was detected in the TV range and, uh, and, and the integration times and sensitivity of SWGO. So you can see that we would be able to see such an object in very short time scale, and even perhaps in the prompt emission, if it is emitting uh, such high energies in the prompt, prompt emission. So this is basically the only opportunity that one would have of probing GRBs with uh, very high energy gamma rays at the prompt. Uh, and so it's, a, it's an excellent size case we are, we are uh, look, uh, going after as well. And uh, of course, being a wide field experiment, we can, we can trigger CTA in many occasions and also complement CTA in the observation of multi-messenger events or even helping localizing multi-messenger counterparts. And, and in, in this sense, it's obvious the synergies that we have with neutrinos. Um, Lasso is going to provide a very good image of the sky in the TV PV range. And uh, SWGO would expand that for the whole sky. So not, not only the Northern Hemisphere, but also the Southern Hemisphere, which means that we would have a full picture of the sky up to the, the PVs and therefore an excellent complement to, to understand what's the origin and what are the, the sources of, uh, of the, the highest, highest energy neutrinos that are being detected by S-Cube, but future by came to net and other, and other experiments. So there is a lot of synergy therefore in the multi-messenger field as well. So let me present a little bit to you the SWGO collaboration itself. So I'm one of the, the three co-spokespersons of the collaboration. The other is, is Jim Hinton from, from the Max Planck in Heidelberg. And there is also Petra Huntemeyer uh, from Michigan Tech, who is also the, the current PI of, uh, of Hawk. And, uh, but we have uh, 47 institutes around 12 countries. So these are the, the member countries, plus a number of uh, supporting scientists from, from the countries marketing uh, in orange here. There is a very big component of uh, South American countries participating in the experiment. So Argentina, Chile, um, Brazil, of course, and Peru. And Bolivia is, is one proponent. It's not a member country, but it's a proponent for a site of SWGO. So I think it's also, this means that it's a very important experiment for the continent and that the continent can benefit a lot from, from, from this uh, experiment. I couldn't uh, go over uh, this slide without uh, uh, bringing uh, to, to us the memory of uh, Ron Schellert, who very sadly, and uh, is still uh, having an impact on us, uh, passed away last week. Um, Schellert was behind the proposal of an of experiment that was a precursor of SWGO, that was the lattice experiment, also for wide field monitoring of the southern sky in gamma rays. And uh, later on, this experiment, Lattice, this proposal has merged with uh, another initiative uh, led by the Germans, which was called SGSO. And, uh, and, and Shalab was behind putting these two communities together to form SWGO. And he was currently serving as country representative for Brazil in the, in the steering board of, uh, of SWGO. So we owe uh, a great deal to him on this experiment, but of course, uh, in a lot of instances in, 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 in Brazilian science in astroparticle physics. So he, he is already greatly missed. So this is a pictorial view of uh, what SWGO will look like. So our detector will be based on water tanks, uh, which means that the, the particles, the secondary particles of the shower are going to enter the tanks and produce strength of light locally, which will be detected by photomultipliers. And then uh, we are going to reconstruct the image of the shower from, from, the, the, from the triggered uh, detector units uh, to reconstruct uh, the, the gamma ray properties. So as you can see here, it's going to be a very large detector. We are going to have something between 5,000 and 6,000 units. So compare that with the 1,600 of OGM. And much more compact than OGM, we are going to have, but it's still very large. So we are going to have a core of around 80,000 uh, um, square meters, uh, which is already larger than Hulk. And, uh, and then uh, an outer array, more sparse for the higher energies that will extend uh, very likely up to one kilometer square or even beyond one kilometer square in area. So there's a lot to be defined yet, but this is the general picture of the detector we are proposing. And uh, so 
The basic design is based on tanks, but we are also investigating the possibility of putting the, the bags with the detectors and the clean water inside a natural lake. And there are several natural lakes in Peru at very high altitude that could be used for that, or even building an artificial pond, although the costs of that um, are, are, are a bit too much. And uh, probably if we cannot go to, to a natural lake, we'd go to, to the tank design. But we are investigating all possibilities really to find the best solution for such a detector. There are several potential sites for installation of uh, SWJ, all of them in South America and in the Andes, because we need an altitude of at least 4.4 kilometers above sea level. So this is quite extreme, actually, uh, and is a challenge for operations or for construction. But we need that if, if we want to lower the energy threshold towards uh, the 100 GV range or the hundreds of uh, GV range where we can do transient and multi-messenger science. So we really want to push uh, this altitude limit to, to the highest we can. And there is a number of sites proposed in Argentina, Bolivia, Chile, and Peru that uh, are within this mark. And some, some of them are even very close to, to five kilometers above sea level, uh, it's particularly one of the lakes in Peru. So these are picture of the sites. So they all look very beautiful, very dry, very flat, and very wide. So these are all the characteristics that we're actually looking for. And uh, this is one of the lakes that we're investigating in Peru. So there is actually a dam here, so it's a reservoir uh, at 4.9 kilometers. This lake has, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, more than one kilometer square in area. So it's more than enough for our detector. So it's really impressive. And uh, we, we want to explore the possibility of using these kinds of, uh, of environments that have never been considered before. Um, although, of course, the, the uncertainties are much larger because, I mean, no one has ever operated an, an, an experiment like this in a lake. Um, so we are doing over this next year, the site character. So we, we have done, sorry, this year, the site characterization. And uh, early in January, we are going to proceed to site shortlisting. So we plan to keep uh, only a handful of these sites for later evaluation during the, the couple of years to come to then decide uh, the single site where we are going to install SWGO. But let me also underline that here, one of the things that we are fighting very hard for is to keep everybody on board once the site is selected. So to select a site in one of the countries doesn't mean the others are off the game. On the contrary, we think this experiment has a lot to do and to contribute to, to the science of astroparticle physics in Latin America in general and to the collaboration between our countries. And so we do want to keep everybody on board and, uh, and make sure everybody uh, can participate actively in the experiment even after site selection. So this is one of the challenges we are we are we are putting to ourselves. So this is the reference configuration for SWJ. As I said, eighty thousand uh, square meters with unprecedented high density of eighty percent, so that we can detect a, a large amount of particles at the low energies. And then the reference configuration was going to two hundred and twenty thousand square meters with a lower density. But we are more and more sure after last results that we're going to expand this to others, uh, the kilometer square. And a very important feature of our detector, and this is one, one example, one possible solution, is that we aim to have two layers of, uh, of water terrain of detection separated by a, a, an optical separator, which means that we can see the electromagnetic component of the shower in the top chamber, and then the low chamber only gets the moons that punch through uh, so that we can count the moons First, to have a, a very precise study of cosmic rays in one, in one hand, and second, for gamma hadron separation, which is strongly based on the muon content of the hadron showers, which is very high, uh, in opposition to the muon, muon count, uh, content of the electromagnetic showers, which is very low. So it's very important that we are able to identify moons uh, very well with our detectors. There is another solution we are also investigating, and uh, this is because, uh, as you can see here, this is 1.7 meters high, this is not marked here, but this is almost four meters high and four meters wide. So water is a big thing. I mean, for 6,000 units of this detector here, we, are, we would be using something like two times 10 to the five uh, tons of water, which is a lot. And water is, is a big part of the cost of the experiment. It can go between 30 to 50% of the cost of an experiment like this, because we are in high, dry, high, high altitude dry areas. So water is a, is a scarce resource. So in order to, to, to reduce the amount of water, we are considering new designs where, for example, we put multiple PMTs, multiple PMTs at the bottom of the tank and try to identify the moons by the asymmetry with which they illuminate the different PMTs. 
So this is a, is a, is a technique, it's a new technique, which uh, depends a lot on, on machine learning. And we are developing uh, the analysis to see if we can do that with uh, high precision. Um, we are also studying lots of uh, detector options in all fronts. So not only mechanics, but uh, photo detectors and electronics chain. And here following uh, a question that, uh, that uh, Rogério asked me in a, in a previous presentation, we have lots of technical challenges. And uh, I, I listed the main ones here. So we want to achieve excellent gamma hadron separation to the, to the order of 10 to the minus four or 10 to the minus five, which means that we keep only one hadron in uh, 10 or 100,000. And this is very important if you want to observe sources at the PV range. And 10 to the minus five is actually the gamma hadron separation sensitivity that LASSO has, which is amazing. So we, we do need to, to push this front. And, uh, but of course, LASSO has buried the instruments. It can measure um, uh, muons very efficiently, but it's very costly. And uh, since we want to, to do this experiment for a fraction of the cost of LASSO, we want to do this with only a compact surface detector. So this, this is, is going to be, yes. Five minutes. Thank you, thank you. So this is going to be challenged, but uh, we, we are in for it. Uh, since we're going to be operating 6,000 units uh, at 5,000 meters above sea level, we want to build a near maintenance free detector that can work with minimum maintenance for a decade or two. Um, uh, can we deploy a reliable detector in a natural lake? It's another big question we are asking ourselves. And can we lower the individual unit thresholds to detect 100 GV gamma rays, which, have never been, which has never been done before? So this is another challenge. And of course, we are going to have something between 10 and 20,000 electronics channels and uh, solutions for that, electronic configure solutions for that are a big part of our work. So this is just an image showing uh, how uh, a 14 TV and a 600 GV, GV shower would look in our detector. And uh, the altitude is very important for us to maximize the number of triggered units here so that we can reconstruct the shower as, as well as possible. We have a big phase space that we are going to explore with SWGO. So this is our Strawman, so our baseline. And then we have all this yellow band here in which uh, we are probing uh, different uh, configurations that can reach the different sensitivities. And uh, as you can see marked here, uh, basically to reach the very high energies of LASSO, which is the black curve here, it only depends on the, basically on the capacity of gamma hadron separation we can achieve and the area we can cover. <clears throat> but you can see that, uh, so this is, a, this is really a frontier for us, but you can see that uh, throughout the, the, the spectrum, we are going to probably perform better than, uh, than LASSO, and, uh, which is very, very uh, promising. And uh, as I mentioned already, I mean, we are probably going to expand uh, the, the reference configuration here to something that goes toward the kilometer square uh, that uh, I, uh, I show in this picture. Another big question we are asking ourselves is how far we can push the angular resolution. So this is the theoretical limit. And as you can see, the current uh, Hawk experiment can achieve in its best uh, uh, energy range, something like uh, 0.2 or 0.3 degrees in angular resolution. This is already very good, but uh, we do want, want to push that closer at, at least in the higher energies to what CTA can do so that we can really do morphology of sources and really expand the view that CTA is going to give us of these sources towards the higher energies. So to reach that, we think it's possible, but there is a lot of techn technological challenges as well that we are, we are working on. And this basically depends on uh, the amount of particles we can detect uh, and uh, the time resolution we can achieve in the individual units. As I mentioned, uh, just to conclude, uh, the fact that we may be able to count moons, individual moons, means that we can do unprecedented mass separation, even between four mass channels, uh, for, for a very good uh, composition studies of cosmic rays in the range up to, to several PV. And, uh, and this is going to uh, be very useful to complement what uh, Lasso and Hawker are doing in the Northern Hemisphere and Ice Cube with Ice Top is doing in the Southern Hemisphere. So there is a, a, a latitude gap between these experiments that uh, SWJO uh, would, would fill in, which means that we would have a complete, uh, a complete sky map for measuring, for example, an isotropy of cosmic rays and, and, and resolve uh, the mass uh, of these cosmic rays over the anisotropy um, features. 
So to conclude, uh, I, I hope I made it clear that there is a, a need and a large science potential for a wide field experiment uh, in, in the gamma ray range in the southern hemisphere. It will complement LASSO in terms of visibility of the sky. It will have strong synergies with CTA in the sense that it observes higher energies, but also it's, it's a survey instrument, a, a large area, a wide field of view instrument, and it will be a key player in the most multi-messenger arena. We are halfway in our R&D phase, so we are going to uh, have our, our site shortlist uh, early next year, and then start studying the site in a lot of detail to arrive at a configuration definition and site definition by the end of 2023. And of course, this is an experiment with a, a big Brazilian leadership. There, is, there are lots of Brazilian people in, in, in important positions in the collaboration, and uh, we look forward to expand our collaboration with other groups. So new partners and new ideas are very welcome. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Ulysses, uh, for the nice talk. So I expect questions, many questions. Who starts? Márcio? Marcos. Marcos, yeah, Marcos. No, it's a very quick, uh, probably you have thought about it. So, uh, is there any environmental concern on this putting all these tanks inside the lakes? Yeah, so this is one thing that we are investigating. So it's a, it's an important question. I mean, all the lakes that we are looking into, they are um, reservoirs. So they are artificial lakes that were built by, with dams to, to reserve water either for mining or for, for, for the local communities. So of course we are in, in, in close contact with the communities um, because one, one important impact is, is on the water availability to these communities. And, uh, and the other thing, of course, is any life that exists on the lake, you don't want to cover the whole surface of the lake with, uh, with uh, detectors that, uh, um, in, uh, that stop the coming of light into, into the bottom of the lake. So these are things that we are looking into and uh, they are surely going to play a part in our decision to go or not to go for a lake. So they are, they are important. And let me say as well that uh, um, discussions with the local communities and the local governments also about the amount of water that we are going to use in these places where water is a, is a rare resource is also a thing that we are we are taking very ser seriously and uh, discussing very closely with the communities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other question? Someone? Okay, I, I have a question that's very technical that's regarding the site. Uh, remember you contacted me some time ago this year for uh, some help from EMPI uh, for site selection. How did the thing go? Did, did you guys uh, proceed with the guys from meteorology group here? Yeah, so sorry, I closed my video because I, it was breaking up a little bit. So this is about the, the site selection, yes? The site short. Yes. Piece. Yes. So yes, the discussion didn't go very, very far. Uh, unfortunately, I, I, I think I have to push a little bit more the, the, the site group to, to keep contact with them, but uh, they had some exchanges. But in any case, I mean, the, the um, analysis for the moment has been uh, very simple analysis only for the site shortlisting. From next year on, we are going to really start the detailed analysis. And I guess that then, uh, the site working group is going to turn more into the satellite data for, for detailed uh, information. Okay. Uh, if you need any, any yes, other thanks, help, Alex, let for, me know. for bridging us in that. Okay. Uh, any other question? Uh, anybody else? Okay, I have one more. Um, you know, from the top of my head, I may be, I may be missing some of the energy ranges that uh, that are related to these showers, but do uh, does SWGO uh, is it able to to probe the GZK effect in the in the energy range that it's going to observe? No, no, the GZK uh, it appears in, in in the cosmic ray signals uh, in the EV uh, range, so above ten to the eighteen to the ten to twenty one range. So it's uh, it's really uh, a range for OGA and telescope array. So this is completely off our, our observational potential. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? 
what we we do, uh, what we I mean, I think the greatest contribution we are going to give in the in the cosmic ray frontier is first of all to try to study these these anisotropies in the TV to PV range with mass composition, uh, which would be unprecedented, and uh, by detecting pevatrons, really to make a census of the the particle accelerators of the highest energy galactic cosmic rays. So this would probably give us a, a good handle or, on uh, which, which uh, sources are actually being responsible for, for producing the galactic cosmic rays and to understand better the, the distribution and, and, and the evolution of these particles in the galaxy. So I guess this is the big, the big thing that we are going to do for cosmic rays. Okay, thank you, Lucius. There's no more questions. Uh, I'll hand the, the screen to Diego for the next talk. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Ulysses. It's all yours, Diego. Okay. Can you see yes. presentation? Okay, I'll talk from a different uh, uh, login name because my microphone from my laptop is ruined. So I hope you hear well. Yeah, it's loud and clear. Okay, perfect then. May I start? Sure. Okay. So in this presentation, the idea is to um, talk about the CTA project, right? The implementation of CTA. Uh, we are part, uh, especially my contribution here uh, is coming from the small telescopes. Uh, I'll talk more about this, so I'll touch on that too. And then eventually if I have time, so Alex, you give me the hand on this, I'll talk about uh, applications of uh, CTA observations in star forming regions, which is the main uh, focus of my research. So as Ulysses already uh, talked about. So CTA will be um, an instrument focused on gamma ray observations. So gamma uh, rays are the most energetic photons that we can detect. And the, the good thing about being in a, a planet with atmosphere is that the atmosphere, uh, though not very good for uh, optical telescopes or UV telescopes, it's quite good for gamma rays because uh, of the um, Cherenkov effect. So it's basically because of the atmosphere that we can do this technique. And uh, it results uh, from the pair production of the gamma rays as they interact with the, the, the nuclei of the gas in, in the atmosphere. These uh, charged particles that uh, arise, they are typically superluminal considering the uh, speed of light in the atmosphere. And then uh, this results in this uh, shock, uh, shock-like effect, but in the electromagnetic field that disturbs the polarized uh, molecules, the alignment of them in the, in the atmosphere. Uh, this results in the deceleration of the particles, the charged particles produced by the gamma ray. And as these molecules, they return back to the normal state, they will emit in the visible or the UV light. And then this uh, visible and UV light will be detected by optical telescopes uh, on the ground. So this is uh, the Cherenkov uh, radiation. And these instruments, they are called Imaging Air Cherenkov Telescopes, IACTs. There are several IACTs in the, in the world now. And uh, CTA will be probably the the largest uh, in the in the near future, future of the IACTs in operation. So um, the um, the gamma uh, rays uh, are responsible for the for the Cherenkov um, effect, but also hadrons can do this. So if a, a high energy proton or uh, even iron nuclei, they enter the atmosphere, they can also uh, do the same effect. But um, uh, thanks to the, to the different um, processes that come from the, from the different uh, primary sources, uh, 
uh, the telescopes can identify the difference between the gamma ray um, uh, interacting with the atmosphere and the Hadron interacting with the atmosphere. The, the typical observation here is the, the field of view projected in the, the mirror. So this is a simulation, of course, but uh, uh, there is a, a, different of the, a difference between the imaging of the two processes. So uh, if you have uh, good resolution for the observations, you can uh, clearly separate the effect of of hadrons and gamma rays. So this is not a, a major issue for, for CTA. So what's uh, CTA? Actually, CTA is the uh, composition of uh, two sets of uh, telescopes. Uh, one of them is uh, being built in La Palma. Uh, so it's the Northern Hemisphere. And the other one in Chile, Paranal. Uh, which will be um, where our contribution, Brazilian contribution, at least um, for the SSTs will be uh, more important. This is also the largest uh, array uh, in the Southern hemisphere. So the idea is to have the full sky coverage uh, using the, the two sites. So the consortium for the CTA is, is really large. So it's uh, about, uh, these numbers change, right? So uh, the last one that I got was uh, 31 countries, over 200 institutes, over uh, 1,400 people, uh, all of them working for one uh, for one purpose, which is to bring in operation the the largest Cherenkov telescope uh, in, on Earth. Okay. Uh, the current status of CTA is the transition, transition phase. So the, the main uh, projects uh, are done. The selection of the instruments have been also done. The first testings have been done. The, the budget is uh, mostly uh, allocated. So the next uh, step will be to start producing the 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 less designs, there is still uh, margin for uh, adjustments of the, the instruments. This should be done um, by the end of 2022. And in 2023, we'll have the probably the green light to start the production of the, the instruments. And then implementation of the first array will be in uh, four or five years from now. Uh, the, the CTA will be uh, composed of uh, three different uh, telescopes. Here, there are many, but I'll talk about them. So the, the first design is uh, the large telescope. This will be focused, uh, the instrumentation is, is developed to focus on the uh, lower energies. The medium sized one has been chosen. There were, there were two designs to be chosen. It has already been, been chosen. And uh, the same has happened to the small telescopes. There were three design, different designs uh, being tested by different uh, groups in different countries. And uh, good news for Brazil is that uh, the design developed by Brazil and Italy has been chosen by, by the CTA consortium for the for the implementation of the, the small telescope uh, array. So this is the, the Brazilian, the Italian Brazilian design that has been, been chosen, which is the, the one on the left. Um, the small telescopes are very important for CTA because they provide the large coverage um, on ground. The largest coverage on, on, on ground will be of the, the small telescopes, which gives you very high sensitivity for very uh, high energy. So we'll be operating um, these small telescopes around one TeV. So this is um, the design of the distribution of the Southern Array. So we will have large telescopes, medium-sized telescopes, and these small uh, telescopes distributed in about three kilometer uh, in diameter. The large telescopes will be concentrated on the central part, then followed by the medium-sized telescopes, and the small um, size telescopes will cover the, the, the whole area. The ideal 
configuration, we'll have four large telescopes, 25 medium-sized telescopes and 70 small-sized telescopes. Uh, for now, uh, the CTAO has chosen to start with the alpha configuration. The alpha configuration is a cheaper implementation, but at least it will um, allow the instruments to start operating before the, the final implementation of the, of the array. In the alpha configuration, we won't have the large size telescopes uh, yet. We'll have a smaller number of medium-sized telescopes and um, slightly above half of the, the optimal number of small-sized telescopes. This won't be uh, compromising the, the, the sensitivity that much, um, uh, especially at, at least from, from the simulations, or Monte Carlo simulations, uh, it didn't show any substantial change in the, the sensitivity, of course, but uh, of, uh, on the resolution, there is some, uh, some issues. Uh, but still, it's better than, than what we have now. Um, in the optimal uh, implementation, so CTA will be uh, up to 20 times uh, more sensitive than the current instruments. It will cover four decades in uh, energy spectrum. Uh, it will have a larger field of view, as Ulysses already mentioned, it will be about 80, uh, eight degrees, and it will have better resolution. It, it will depend on the, on the energy. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this. And a very fast uh, survey speed, uh, mostly because of the small telescopes. So this is, is, is what I mentioned that uh, for now, because of the pandemics and because of budgetary issues, uh, the idea is to implement the um, alpha configuration uh, in the Northern uh, Hemisphere with only four large telescopes and no, nine medium-sized telescopes. In the Southern Array in Chile, it will be um, only 14 medium-sized telescopes and 37 uh, small size telescopes. And then uh, it will add um, in the beta configuration, which will be the enhanced project. It will be the second phase of implementation of the instruments. It will add the four large telescopes. Um, and uh, actually last week, we, we have now uh, been warned that this number has changed to 40. So this is good, doesn't change much, but uh, the budget from the Italian part is already uh, separated for, for construction of 40 instruments. So it will be initially 14 medium size and 40 small size telescopes. And then in the second stage, they will add four large telescopes to the, to the array in the Southern hemisphere. So this is, these are the, the numbers expected for the sensitivity of the CTA. So CTA South, uh, because of the larger number of, of instruments, the, the coverage from the SSTs will have the best uh, sensitivity. It will focus on the range of uh, one to 10 uh, tera electron volts. Uh, this is uh, similar to what we have from MAGIC and, and HAS, but as, as mentioned before, with a factor of 5 to 20 uh, in the sensitivity from, from the best instruments that we have. Uh, this is important because uh, uh, many thresholds, especially from, from uh, as an example, uh, Ulysses mentioned uh, dark matter. Uh, so depending on the, on the mass of the, the components of the dark matter, uh, if um, most of the energy will be observed in TeV, there are thresholds which lie between these two lines. So uh, magic and has cannot be able to, to detect dark matter, but um, probably CTA will if the particles that uh, compose dark matter are, are indeed those that uh, decay in gamma rays of these energies in this energy range. So this is very interesting uh, for the for the near future. Uh, the 
the Brazilian involvement in the CTA occurs in, in, in the three uh, types of telescopes. So the group, um, myself, uh, Elizabeth Del Pino and Adriana Valio, we are leading the thematic project that um, is involved with uh, Italy in the development of the of the small space telescope, uh, the <laughs> small scale telescope. The um, uh, group from from São Carlos, uh, Victor, uh, they are helping on the construction of the medium sized telescope. And Ulysses has been um, helping with the group in Rio for the development of the uh, large size telescopes. So this is the distribution here. The 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 list is is quite um, non updated, non updated. So here, in memory of Shellen, uh, Ulysses is, is is leading the the real contribution for the LST. Victor is leading the contribution for the MST. And here we are from our thematical FAPESP, we are leading the contribution for the SST at the University of São Paulo. So the total cost uh, rough estimate for the CTA is uh, 400 million euro. Um, this is the average contribution expected from each of the countries. Of course, this is uh, not uh, symmetric or homogeneous, but this uh, should be more or less the contribution of, of each country. Brazil has so far spent uh, 4.5 million euro in, in the whole project. So we are summing up here the different um, projects and we are uh, asking for the second uh, thematic project uh, next year uh, we with the inclusion of uh, plus 1.5 million euros so it will go to 6 million euro if everything goes smoothly and we should um, uh, spend the money in the structures in the mechanical structures to be built in brazil uh, the the success of the the SST uh, comes from from this instrument. Uh, actually, it's a small array. It's called the Astri Mini Array. Uh, Brazil and Italy, with the help of uh, South Africa and Spain, we have been developing this for for the past five six years. This instrument has been tested in in Italy, then sent to to uh, Canary Islands um, this year. So the final implementation, assembly, and verification will be in uh, June, July next year, 2022. Uh, this array uh, has already been, been tested, as I said, a few instruments in, in Italy with very good sensitivity. Uh, the instruments are operating the way the CTA expected. So this was the precursor for the for the for the SSTs in in the CTA, this will still be operating in in Spain, uh, not related to the CTA uh, consortium, but it will help probably by finding some uh, interesting objects that may uh, be targeted for 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 the CTA. So this is a, a interesting uh, contribution from Brazil as well. The next uh, steps for the SSTs will be, as I said, uh, to provide the money for the mechanical components of these 37 to 40 um, um, uh, SSTs uh, for the CTA South. Brazil would manufacture these components, send them, send them uh, ship them to Italy. Italy will assemble these, these structures with the mirrors and they will ship the whole structure, the, the, the mechanical parts and the mirrors to Chile. So it's a very complicated logistics, but uh, they have found that this is the, the best um, because there is no expectation to have a crew, engineering and mechanical crew in Chile to, to uh, assemble the, the, the instruments in the proper way and do the, the, the verification uh, phase. So this will be the best. The approximate cost for Brazil will be 12 billion reais. Uh, this is for now the estimates. It will probably increase if the, the euro 
the exchange rate continues to 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 change like in the past year but this is a, a good estimate and we have here a, a team of engineers and uh, uh, technical support which is very efficient and they're very good so what's the the kind of science that we expect to 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 do with the cta cta will obviously be sensitive enough for galactic objects and extra galactic uh, sources as well uh, there are many sources which have already been uh, detected uh, with magic has and many other uh, high energy uh, instruments so the idea is to complement them with uh, less bright uh, uh, objects um, in the in the physics itself, the, it, one important point is that the acceleration of, of particles in, in, the, in the universe is not uh, that well established yet. So people who work on, on particle acceleration, they know that. So one of I the, the okay, okay, Alex, thank you. So one of the main questions still open is how and where the particles are accelerated how they propagate and what's their impact in the environment before they're uh, detected. So these, these, uh, these particles, they may be accelerated in, in many different objects, as, as you know, so black holes, compact objects uh, are the, the main target so far, but there are non-compact objects as well, uh, which are very important for the particle acceleration, like um, uh, strongly magnetized, uh, objects with, with, uh, which are not uh, compact, like a neutron star or black hole, but also uh, 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 stellar winds, for instance, which is the, the case of, uh, of this example that I'll give in, in, in one or two minutes. So the, the expectation is to increase the, the, the full sky here survey of the of objects from a few hundreds of, uh, of the TV catalog to thousands of objects that should be detected with the, the CTA. Uh, another important point of CTA is that it has a large field of view, so you can observe uh, extended objects and with very good, uh, very fine resolution. So compare here 0.1 degrees of uh, Has Magic and Veritas, and uh, the CTA will be two arc minutes in, in resolution. So uh, here, for instance, uh, using HAS, you know that Centaurus A is a source of, of um, uh, gamma rays, but you don't know where it was uh, generated, if it's in the central black hole or if it's in the shock of the bubble or uh, magnetic reconnection along the jet. So it's not clear yet where this, these uh, particles are being generated. So a CTA will be able to, to provide this mapping of the, of the whole system. So this is basically a pictorial way of understanding the, the, the whole of CTA. So this is uh, the tip of the icebergs that we know from galactic and extra galactic sources. And the idea is to go deeper and understand most of the, the particles are coming from different sources, which are not that energetic as um, pulsar binaries or blazers or so. So uh, one of the, the applications of the CTA that I am particularly most interested in is non-compact non massive stars. Massive stars are uh, in their uh, majority in, in binary, found in binary or multiple systems. The reasoning for that is that they, uh, you cannot uh, form a massive star um, alone, there is a radiative bond accretion effect, which is uh, well described recently. Uh, Non-compact massive binary systems are known to produce strong shocks because each of these OB stars, they have uh, wind speeds of 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers per second, and they are quite dense. Uh, so they create strong shocks. These shocks are known or expected to be the source of very high energy particles, gamma rays and X-rays since uh, the early 90s by the classical papers of uh, Usov and Eichler. And uh, these uh, objects, the, since uh, the counting of these objects, of, of course, larger than, than, than 
uh, close compact um, uh, objects, um, and also they live for longer times, the idea is that these objects can uh, be continuous, but less bright, of course, sources of gamma rays in star forming regions. So what's the colliding uh, wind binary? So you have the two stars here, like uh, two O stars, a Volfa A and an O star, a B star. They uh, have this continuous wind. If they are close enough, these uh, winds, they will shock forming um, heated, high density, and magnetically uh, magnetic fields are compressed as well. Uh, this region here would, would then be the source of X-rays and gamma rays. So this is observation of um, Vofaye 140. This is done in, in radio wavelengths uh, and is uh, the source of the radio wavelength here is the radio emission here is uh, synchrotron. And they have uh, estimated the energies here for these electrons to be um, relatively uh, high. So much higher than you should expect just from thermal uh, component. So the non-thermal component uh, has to be accelerated somehow. This has been an issue for many, many years. The first uh, full MHD numerical simulation of this colliding wind uh, uh, was done by our group. And we shown in 2012 that the magnetic uh, energy density in the shock is much larger if you, if you consider cooling, which is usually neglected, uh, compared to a model uh, which is adiabatic. And in 2015, we have made some estimates uh, of the um, top energies that you could observe from, from these particles accelerated from these regions. And we estimated something between one to 10 TeVs in a short time scales, few hours or a couple of days, we'll have the acceleration of these particles. And uh, this was not, uh, of course, a full energy distribution. It was not done uh, solving the, the full equation of the distribution of particles, but it was only the, the maximum energies estimate. So recently we have done, we have performed very high resolution uh, numerical simulations, again, magnetically hydrodynamical simulations. Um, and on top of that, we have implemented with Chekhov's uh, Kopal, we'll talk tomorrow, um, a module for particle acceleration distribution integration. So, but uh, not the distribution itself, like a Fokker Planck uh, equation solver. But um, uh, we introduce uh, individual particles and we iterate the, mag uh, the, the electromagnetic field with the distribution, the distribution of velocity of the particles. And then we iterate these this distributions over time. So we have billions of particles being accelerated in this system. And uh, this is a time distribution, uh, time evolution of the distribution showing uh, when you have the acceleration of uh, tail of the, the, the highest energy particles, we reach uh, TeV energies. We get something like 1% of the total number of particles above tens of GeVs, hundreds of GeVs up to, to TeV. So they would be detected by, by CTA. We can also find the these slopes of these distributions. So we have uh, predictions of the, the source of the high energy uh, tail of the, the particles that could be de uh, detected by, by CTA. And this is the, the map of, of where the, the particles are being accelerated at most. And, and this is where uh, we have predicted in 2012. So this is actually a confirmation of what we have predicted that most of the particles would be accelerated in the uh, strong magnetic field islands in the shocks of cool, uh, winds with the, the consideration of the cooling effects. This is very important. So let's go to reality. Uh, unfortunately, just one example of uh, colliding wind binary has been detected. Um, there, there is a has detection of Eta Carina, which is one of the most massive uh, 
systems in the galaxy. Uh, this uh, was done just uh, for periastron passage, uh, which is when the, the stars are closer. This line, blue line, is the predicted um, energy distribution for the, for the periastron. And the green is predicted for the, um, for the, for the, so, sorry, it's uh, for periastron, yes. And this is for a pastron distribution. So CTA is, is, is indicated here as being able to detect uh, at both phases, uh, both periastron and a pastron. Uh, passages. So we can follow the whole uh, evolution the, 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 of, the, of the system along its, its period. So as, um, as a possible future for, for the, the star forming regions and, and the understanding of gamma rays from these objects uh, using CTA is exactly to follow up along several months the orbital um, uh, evolution of these systems. And this will uh, provide us uh, information of what's the main process, uh, physical process, that's generating these very high energy particles. And um, we, our group, uh, we believe that the, these massive, non-compact uh, massive objects, they, they have a, uh, a very uh, important role on this. So this is yet to, to be confirmed. Uh, by by CTA. So that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thanks, Diego. Uh, since the, that's the last speaker, and uh, I don't know if there will be a paredão in the morning or only the afternoon, we have time for a few questions and then uh, leave. Uh, if, uh, if there are too many, we'll have it in the afternoon. Anybody? No questions for Diego? Unbelievable. Come on, people. Hi, Alex. I, I, have, <laughs> I have a question. Go, <laughs> no, please, Elise. So, Diego, thanks, thanks for the talk. Um, Diego, I have a, a, two questions about uh, the Astro Mini Array. The first uh -huh. one, if you could um, talk a little bit about uh, the timeline of development of the Mini Array, I think it's going to come online earlier than CTA. So, it will, yes. it will precede CTA activities. And then what is your science case? So what you are planning to do for the time before CTA is online? And then what is the planning synergies with, uh, with CTA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks, Elise. It's a very good question. Indeed, the, the, the mini array is uh, already um, being built. So uh, the timeline is by, if everything goes right, so by July next year, the AIV will start in, 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 in Canary Island. So the idea is to have the AIV in July next year. So the, the tests of the, the, the equipment will be done by July. So from July, we, if everything goes right, we can start doing the, the, the science cases. Uh, the first uh, the science case would be, of course, um, check uh, the detection of the objects already from the, the TEVCAT. So we'll just uh, check the same objects as, as, as already have in the, in the catalogs. And also the, uh, especially uh, the, the Italians, they are very interested in the star forming regions as well. So I think we should uh, spend a good time on that. Uh, eventually find some new sources for the follow-up on the, on the CTA in five years uh, or so. So that's, that's uh, a plan. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks for the explanation, Diego. Any other question? Comments? Okay, so I think people are getting hungry and we'll break for lunch. So we'll come, uh, we'll come back at 2, uh, 2 p.m. I'll try to make a point to show up for the discussion. We'll not be able to come for the talk because of the testing that uh, I'll start right now. 
So the, no lunch time for me, but I'll try to see you during the discussions. Thanks everybody for staying uh, in the morning session and see you in the afternoon. Bye everybody. Bye-bye.